interpretations in which two historians take up opposing positions on major Irish historical figures. The subject today is the United Irishmen leader, Wolf Tone. The programme is presented by Miles Dungan. Mr. Hawhey was speaking at the annual Fianna Foy commemoration for Wolf Tone. Liam Cattle, RTE News, Bodenstown. Wolf Tone. Bodenstown. In County Kildare. Bodenstown. Oh, in Bodenstown churchyard there is a green grave, and wildly around it the wintry winds rave. Small shelter I ween are the ruined walls there When the storm sweeps over the plains of Kildare Why do members of two Irish political parties pay annual homage at this Kildare cemetery to a man who ended his life as an officer of the French army? Why is the name Bodenstown so evocative that it lures the luminaries of Fianna Fáil and Sinn Féin here to separate acts of commemoration every year? Who was Wolf Tone? Is he a bona fide icon in the Republican pantheon of Pierce's Fenian dead? Is he a dilettante who ended his days as a militant Irish Republican simply because he was frustrated in his attempts to become a colonist, an MP, or even a decent barrister? does he deserve a reputation tarnished by the excesses of late 20th century militant republicanism? Or should he rest easily in his grave, safe in the knowledge that his ideas were sound, but his intellectual legacy has been exploited and manipulated by others? Once I lay on that sod, it lies over Wolf Town, and thought how he perished in prison alone. Elements of high idealism, elements of great personal ambition. And somewhere in the 1790s, these competing aspirations, these competing ambitions coalesced and made Wolfton the icon that he is today. A martyr for Ireland, his grave has no stone. His name seldom named and his virtues unknown. Our commerce will be free. Our arts encouraged, our manufacturers protected. He's a very remarkable and important late 18th century writer. I think in the end maybe that'll be his real importance. Every man shall rank in the state according to his merit and talents. They carry no coffin, they carried no stone, and they stopped when they came to the grave of Wolfton. In 1782, Ireland won a list of independence, but the problem was that the Anglo-Irish relationship remained undefined. Patrick Gagan is a lecturer in history in Trinity College in Dublin and co-convener of the Contesting History Lecture Series. He will be the defender of the reputation of Wolf Tone today. You had an Irish Parliament, but it was still dominated by a Lord Lieutenant and a Dublin Castle elite that were uh, directly taking instructions from London. And you still had examples of Britain trying to legislate for Ireland. Even the Catholic Relief Acts um, in the 1790s are brought in at the request of the British government. So in some respects, the legislative of independence that we now call Grattan's Parliament was a, a myth. It was still a Protestant Parliament for a Protestant people. Thomas Dunn is Professor Emeritus in History at University College Cork and first challenged the political canonization of Tone in the early 1980s. It was still dominated by a very conservative element in the old ascendancy. Its Grattanite stroke radical or Whig wing was a minority which had no real power. The Irish Parliament was divided between those who sat on the government benches and those who had uh, ranked themselves with the opposition. And the opposition would generally characterise themselves as Whigs, people who believed in reform. Very few wanted to give Catholics full rights. Part of their resentment towards the British government and the British Parliament trying to legislate for them was the fear that the British Parliament would try and bring in Catholic emancipation. And for people like Wolf Tone, that was unacceptable. It is absolutely necessary that the weight of the people's scale should be increased, and no reform is practicable that shall not include the Catholics. Catholics had achieved a huge amount culminating in the 93 Relief Act. They'd already had most of the discriminatory laws against the generation of property and so on repealed. It only exacerbated the Catholic threat for Protestant conservatives. Tone was very much a man of the middle class. He uh, went to England to study at the Middle Temple to become a barrister. Didn't really take that much interest in his studies. He did become a key member of the Whig clubs, uh, reform clubs that were established in Dublin in June 1789. And for a time it looked like Wolf Tone would get a seat in Parliament. However, in some ways he sabotaged his own rising political career. 
1790-1791, he wrote a pamphlet called Spanish War. The logical conclusion of his arguments was that Ireland should be separate from England. And Sir Henry Cavendish, who was a leading uh, member of the Whig Club, announced that if the author of this pamphlet was serious, he ought to be hanged. It is England who debauches and degrades your gentry. It is England who starves your manufacturers. It is England who keeps your wretched peasantry half-fed, half-clothed, miserable. It is England who buys your legislators to betray you. I think initially the United Irishmen were formed as part of that middle-class reform impetus within Irish Protestantism, especially the centres, and Catholicism. The notion, especially among the centres, that the way to build an alternative political nexus to the ascendancy was to create a middle class alliance across sectarian lines. When the United Irishmen were formed in 1791, essentially they were not very different from many of the other clubs that were in Dublin or in Belfast in that period. They were a reform society, essentially I suppose a kind of a middle class debating society. But one of the key things that Wolftone wanted to have at the heart of the United Irishmen was a pledge that no reform would be just unless it included the Catholics and some people in the United Irishmen thought that that was going a little bit too far, that the Catholics couldn't be trusted. The combination of the, the threat for France, uh, revolutionary fervour, agrarian violence in Ireland, uh, all conspired to make the United Irishmen seem a much greater threat than in fact I think they were to the establishment and the United Irishmen effectively wanted to join the establishment rather than this, uh, to uh, uh, abolish it. I think the banning of them was in a sense a, a, a more of a panic measure uh, reflecting a time of great uncertainty and paranoia. Tone becomes embroiled in the Jackson affair in 1794 and 1795. William Jackson, who was acting as an agent for the, for the French, came to Ireland. Wolf Tone, I suppose very unwisely, wrote a kind of a memorandum. When Jackson was arrested, this memorandum by Tone was discovered on his person. So Tone was therefore in, implicated in uh, treasonous activity. So Wolf Tone was offered a deal. If he accepted his guilt, he would be allowed to go into exile with his family. Uh, he decided then to leave the country and go to America. When they were banned, all that was left was a more radical stance of separatism, and it's only at that point that Tone became a separatist. One would have thought that he would have liked the United States, but he hated America. He thought they were a mean-minded, money-grabbing uh, group of people, and he was desperately unhappy in America. And so he decided to make his way secretly to France. Tone ended up in France almost accidentally. But what's extraordinary is once he was there, with very little by way of introduction, very little by way of a network to call on, managed to become a player in negotiations with the French government and indeed then to become a senior officer in the French army. One of the greatest gambles in Irish history was the Bantry Bay invasion in December 1796. The, the genius behind the gamble was that no one expected an invasion in the middle of winter. No one thought that the French would be crazy enough to try and escape the British blockade around the French ports and then sail all these ships to the south of Ireland. Because it was such a gamble, it caught the British by surprise. The downside of the gamble is that winter was a terrible time to attempt a naval, naval landing. Many of the ships that had been part of this 16,000 invasion force, many of the ships did not arrive in Ireland. Then when they did arrive in Ireland and they arrived at Bantry Bay, it was impossible to land because of the weather conditions. I am now so near the shore that I can, in a manner, touch the sides of Bantry Bay with my right and left hand. Yet God knows whether I shall ever tread again on Irish ground. There is one thing which I am surprised at, which is the extreme sang-froid with which I view the coast. I expected I should have been violently affected, yet I look at it as if it were the coast of Japan. I do not, however, love my country less for not having romantic feelings with regard to her. After ten days hanging around with no sign of, of the British fleet, they were forced to return home. And uh, Tone later commented that Britain hadn't had such an escape since the Spanish Armada. For Tone, the first surprise was how little emotional connection he felt to Ireland, having been away from it for years. And the notion of Tone as in any way a sentimental nationalist, I think, is destroyed by the journals of the Bantry Bay expedition. Tone also, though, at that time, was clearly in favour of the possibility of a military, French military government. The whole Bantry Bay thing throws into certain kind of relief uh, elements in Tone that are generally not talked about in the Irish Nationalist canon. And when he said he saw himself as being in the service of the Republic, clearly at that time 
the Republic was the French Republic. Ah, the French are on the sea, says the Shan Van Vop. Ah, the French are on the sea, says the Shan Van Vop. The French are on the sea, they'll be here without delay. And the orange will decay, says the Shan Van Vop. And the orange will decay, says the Shan Van Vop. As far as the United Irishmen were concerned, uh, 1798 did not happen the way they had planned it. Uh, most of the leadership of the United Irishmen were arrested in March 1798. The leadership then evolved to a kind of a second rank, and they were unable to coordinate a nationwide rebellion. You have two very different kind of outbreaks in the Northeast. You have the Presbyterian radical the centre of United Irish tradition that Tone identified most strongly with. It was over very quickly, relatively limited bloodshed. Lord Edward Fitzgerald died in Dublin in May 1798 and it was believed that his name would have been enough to raise an army in Dublin. So there was no rebellion in Dublin in 1798. What happened in the South East, on the other hand, was exactly the kind of nightmare that Tone was always aware of. Thousands of people are killed in a few weeks. Conflict on a local level is often intensely sectarian. You have Scullabogue where a hundred Protestants and some of their Catholic helpers are burnt in a barn. You see Wexford Bridge where 70 Protestants were piked. But you also see terrible sectarian atrocities on the government side. And then in August uh, 1798, the French landed in the west of Ireland. What may be most striking about it to us now is the complete non-meeting of minds and cultures between the French troops who landed and the local Catholic peasantry. They have some initial victories at Castle Bar, but ultimately the French were not that interested in the conflict. Uh, General Cornwallis arrives with a huge army at Balnamuck to confront the French, and the French put a very minor resistance and then they surrender. The, the French had, had really very little time for the, for the Irish rebels and even offered to hunt them down if the British wanted their assistance. The final gesture in Locksville in 98, his journals are full of despair at the news from Ireland and what had happened to the rebellion. I think he, he felt he had no other option. There's a kind of a doomed fatalism about the, the Dox Willey expedition. The expedition is intercepted by the British. There's a huge naval engagement off Lox Willey. Uh, Wolf Tone fights very bravely, refuses all the French requests to escape, and he's captured, and he arrives on the shore of Ireland in his French uniform, and he's recognised by one of his former classmates from Trinity, and taken into custody straight away and brought to Dublin Castle. Perhaps I may be reserved for a trial, for the sake of striking terror into others, in which case I shall be hanged as a traitor and emboweled. As to the emboweling, je m'en fiche. If ever they hang me, they are welcome to embowel me. Wolfton knew that his life was forfeit at his trial, but he was quite insistent that he wanted to be executed by firing squad rather than death by hanging as a French officer in his French military uniform, but that was refused. As far as the governments were concerned, he was an Irish man and therefore he was a traitor. While he was waiting in prison then, uh, Wolfton took a blade to his own throat. He remained alive for three days in great agony. Uh, his own comments was, I'm sorry that I was such a bad anatomist. But after three days, a surgeon came, a doctor visited Wolfton in a cell and told him not to move, that if he moved his head, he would die. And Wolfton thanked the doctor and he moved his head. And his final words were, what should I wish to live for? I suppose part of the myth of Tone was to deny that he could have taken his own life because he was the founder of Irish nationalism and therefore suicide was unthinkable. By then, anyway, even in coming on that expedition, which was so under-resourced and undermanned that it never had any prospects of success, uh, I think before he left France, his trajectory was death, and I think he knew it. All you who love darkness instead of true light, who dare not yourselves show except in the night, lament your sad loss, let the news spread afar, the great overthrow of the northern star. Derry down, down, derry down, down, derry down, derry down, down, croppies lie down. Tone's basic political philosophy was from the Irish Whig tradition. The Whigs were reformist rather than radical. And Tone, for much of his political career, he sought employment as a Whig. He became a Whig publicist for a period. If he had got serious Whig patronage, I think he'd have ended up a figure rather like Edmund Burke in the English Parliament. He'd have ended up as a radical insider articulating a dissident viewpoint. You have to look at the whole trajectory of Tone's career in the 1790s. In 1790, 
he is committed to a reform of Parliament, and therefore you could classify him as a Whig reformer. However, by the end of the year, he realises that the Whigs are, are just as bankrupt, that the Whigs are quite happy to have a subservient relationship of Ireland towards Britain, whereas Wolf Tone is thinking about different things. He's thinking about separatism, and uh, this is pushing him away from the Whigs, that he's far too radical. Tone's separatism is something that he only articulates with any clarity after he leaves Ireland. England is only seen as the problem when he's run out of all other options, only by getting rid of the English connection then can you topple the ascendancy and establish this rule of virtue through the Catholic and dissenting middle class. Certainly from 1791 you can make a case that Wolfe Tone was a separatist. He wrote a letter to Thomas Russell, his great friend and fellow United Irishman, a fellow revolutionary, in which he said that if Ireland was to be cut off from England, it would lead to a regeneration of the country. Certainly by 1795, it's very explicit. That separatism is, if you like, incidental. It, it is a means towards the end of a middle class takeover of power, get rid of the British connection and you can topple the ascendancy. But that was the sequence of thinking. The route to that separatism is simply as a means to the end of a radical takeover of power. My wishes are in favour of a very strong or in other words, a military government at the outset. And I, for one, am ready to take my share in the danger and responsibility. He loved the uniform. He spent part of his time in Bantry Bay waiting for the storm to abate, composing tunes for an Irish regiment. Tone's radicalism was shot through with that kind of militaristic authoritarian underpinnings. I will pretend loved the military life, but it was uh, in a romantic way rather than in any kind of uh, innately conservative way. Historians like Marion Elliott have stated that Wolfton was no Democrat. On the other hand, the United Irishmen did believe in universal male suffrage and Wolfton supported that proposal. Universal male suffrage would have had quite radical political implications for Ireland in the 1790s. There is even in the very early writings a kind of an authoritarian streak, but when he gets to France and he finds himself in a, an increasingly authoritarian environment. He makes several interventions, for instance, defending the notion of press censorship. I would not destroy the liberty of the press, but I would most certainly restrain it within just and reasonable limits. It is in the interest and security of the people themselves that the government which they have chosen should not be insulted with impunity. In the beginning of his career, when he was seeking any kind of gainful employment. One of his early schemes was to promote, propose to the uh, British Prime Minister twice that himself and his friends established a colony in the Sandwich Islands. His description of the kind of government that that colony would operate on was a military government, where the colonists themselves would have no rights, where the natives certainly would have no rights. For a situation so remote as the one now proposed, it appears to be the only mode, as it may at first be necessary to coerce the colonists a little for their own future good. In a word, the idea is to construct a settlement on somewhat feudal principles. Wolfton himself in later years described this letter to Pitt as, as his folly. He thought the whole scheme was ridiculous. As Ireland changed in the 1790s, so too did Wolfton's views on what was necessary. I think it is fair to say that uh, Wolfton was very much a man of the middle class and very much had the ideas that were consistent with that uh, social position. He didn't really understand the peasantry. I don't think he had really that much respect for the peasantry. But on the other hand, while he was in France, he did write manifestos for the weavers, for example, that he did show perhaps a deeper commitment to some social issues than perhaps uh, he's been given credit for. Seriously, I would attempt an invasion with 100 men. If the men of property will not support us, they must fall. We can support ourselves by the aid of that numerous and respectable class of the community, the men of no property. When he made the statement of men of no property, he was writing in his journal about his negotiation with the French. And he had been trying desperately to persuade the French that the men of property would support them, even some of the gentry, certainly the uh, middle class of the dissenters and the Catholics. Tone was a radical who for a long time was also a monarchist and throughout his entire life was somebody who would have given a high priority to commercial interests. 
I think he was at all times a bourgeois radical in that sense. He did have a commitment to improving the lot, I suppose, of all Irishmen. He wanted a government, he wanted a system that was going to benefit all Catholics, all Presbyterians and all Protestants. And he wanted them to put aside their, their religious divisions and substitute the name of Irishman. And certainly the political implications of that was that uh, whether you were a peasant, whether you were a worker, whether you were middle class or whether you were upper class, you would be part of the Irish Republic. The very same laws which under the English constitution I regard as tyrannical and unjust, I would in a free republic preserve and even strengthen. It is not that in theory the law is bad, but that in practical execution it is tyrannical. What we have in looking at home now is a projection of Pierce's generation rather than a response to what Tone actually wrote and did. One of his greatest skills was that uh, he was a beautiful writer. You could pick up his journals now and they could have been written last week. There's a real sense of fun and adventure and these were published by his widow uh, Matilda in 1826 and I think it's th these the, the life of Tone that created the myth of Tone. For the Fenians, for example, Tone hardly features. Tone's reputation, as we know it today, is largely the creation of Pierce. In his later writings, he developed Tone into this messianic figure, which we can see in retrospect as a kind of projection of himself. I think that Tone and the Tone, the historical actor, are wildly different. None of the other revolutionaries left such writings. That was what Thomas Davis uh, reacted to. That is what inspired Patrick Pierce. That was what, what created the whole cult of tone. That is why um, twice a year at Bodenstown you have uh, Sinn Féin and Fianna Fáil giving uh, speeches at the graveside of Wolf Tone. So rather than Wolf Tone being a creation of Thomas Davis or Patrick Pierce or any of the 19th century, 20th century admirers, uh, Wolf Tone is very much his own creation. I think you can see him best as somebody driven into an extreme position, slowly and often reluctantly, through the absence of alternatives, who retained a basic colonialist outlook. I, I think one of the problems of Wolfton is that it's very easy to deify him, but it's also very easy to demonize him. Yes, if Will William Pitt had accepted his, his proposal, uh, he might have become a British imperialist. Yes, if you become an MP, it is possible that he would have conformed to the system that was in place in Ireland. But these things didn't happen, and events changed in Ireland, and Wolf Tone changed with them, and the person then goes on and changes uh, subsequent events. To subvert the tyranny of our execrable government, to break the connection with England, these were my objects. To unite the whole people of Ireland, and to substitute the common name of Protestant, Catholic, and Dissenter, these were my means. Oh, in Bodenstown churchyard there is a green grave, and wildly around it the wintry winds rave. Far better they suit him to ruin and gloom, until Ireland a nation might build him a tomb. That programme was dedicated to the memory of the late Frank Hart. Reputations is compiled and presented by Miles Dungan. Taking part were Professor Thomas Dunn and Dr Patrick Gogan. Readings were by Bosco Hogan. The consultant for the series is Professor Thomas Bartlett. A more detailed version of the programme can be heard on www.rte.ie forward slash radio forward slash reputations. Next week, the series discusses Hugh O'Neill.